the word God, just G-O-D, is about as meaningless a word as there is in the language, unless you define it. If you have heard of the uh, Dutch philosopher uh, Spinoza, he talked about God all the time. Uh, he was nicknamed, in fact, he talked about God so much, he was nicknamed the God-intoxicated man. Um, what he meant by God, though, was quite different from what the Bible means by God. Uh, Thomas Aquinas talked about God and wrote about God. Immanuel Kant wrote about God. And you have in those three men three different views of God. Three different definitions of the word God. In addition to that, you have all sorts of pagan religions. You've got tribal religions in Africa, tribal religions in Asia. You've got tribal religions in the Americas, all of which talk about God. You have Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of which would deny the definition of God given to us in Scripture. Well, the question is, the next question that arises then, if this term is so vague and, and meaningless, can the term be defined? Can God be defined? And let me read a, a couple of statements from some theologians on this issue. I read uh, from uh, Gordon Kaufman first, and he wrote a book called God the Problem. And this is what he said, God is ultimately profound mystery and utterly escapes our every effort to grasp or comprehend him. Our concepts are at best metaphors and symbols of his being, not literally applicable. That's Gordon Kaufman in God the Problem. God is ultimately profound mystery and utterly escapes our every effort to grasp or comprehend him. Our concepts are at best metaphors and symbols of his, of his being and not literally applicable. Let me read a uh, statement from another theologian, perhaps whose name is more familiar to you. Um, this is Cornelius Van Til. Now, Van Til wrote, If we take the highest being of what we can think in the sense of have a concept of and attribute to it actual existence, we do not have the biblical notion of God. Man cannot think an absolute self-contained being. God is infinitely higher than the highest being of which man can form a concept. That's essentially the same thing that Gordon Kaufman wrote infinitely higher than the highest being of which man can form a concept. God is beyond conceptualization. If we think God, as one neo-orthodox theologian put it, we are not thinking God. If we think God, we are not thinking God. Let me read another uh, quote from uh, W.T. Stace. He wrote an essay called Mysticism and Human Reason. And this is what Stace said. God is utterly and forever beyond the reach of the logical intellect or of any intellectual comprehension, and that in consequence, when we try to comprehend his nature intellectually, contradiction appears in our thinking. God is utterly beyond the reach, utterly and forever beyond the reach of the logical intellect or of any intellectual comprehension, and that in consequence, when we try to comprehend his nature intellectually, contradiction appears in our thinking. And again, I'll read uh, a statement from Van Til, if I can find the proper one here. All teaching of Scripture is apparently contradictory. Since God is not fully comprehensible to us, we are bound to come into what seems to be contradiction in all our knowledge. Our knowledge is analogical and therefore must be paradoxical. Dr. Van Til continues, while we shun as poison the idea of the really contradictory, we embrace with passion the idea of the apparently contradictory. And he continues, 
Shall we follow Karl Barth in saying that contradictions in Scripture do not matter in the least because what the gospel is really all about takes place in a realm above ordinary history? Or shall we, with Gordon Clark, say that the contradiction that we think we see is no real contradiction at all? We cannot follow any of these ways. So Dr. Van Til says, we embrace the apparently contradictory, we shun as poison the really contradictory, but we also say, we also deny uh, that the statement that there is no real contradiction is false. Now, that view is, is very common, not just in neo-Orthodox churches, uh, not just in uh, liberal churches, but in many Reformed churches. And again, it is an attack on thinking. It is an attack at the root on thinking. We cannot think God. If we try to think God, we run into contradiction, and therefore it is useless to pursue this by intellectual or logical processes. Well, what does the Westminster Confession say about it? I have here the um, Shorter Catechism, and the fourth question of the Shorter Catechism is, what is God? Now that is uh, asking for a definition. And uh, the answer is, of course, God is mysterious, ineffable, unknowable, and totally other. Does anybody recall that answer from your study of the catechism? They say that God is beyond the reach of the human intellect. That's not what the Bible teaches, and it's not what the catechism says. The catechism says God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. The catechism gives a sentence in which various attributes of God are listed, and like the Bible itself, expects us to learn what those terms mean. The catechism and the Bible do not say God is ineffable, unknowable, totally other, beyond the reach of human conceptions. It gives several human conceptions which are revealed in Scripture and defines the term God. The men who wrote the Westminster Confession and the Catechism understood that if you don't define terms, you don't know what you're talking about. And if you look at the Catechism, uh, both the larger and the shorter sometime, you'll see that much of it consists of definitions. What is God? What is man? What is justification? What is sanctification? And their goal is to give a definition of terms in concise fashion that can be memorized. So in one, perhaps at most two or three sentences, you can have in mind the definition of these terms. And that's the goal. There is no anti-intellectual nonsense about the terms being undefinable or beyond the reach of human conception. Let's... Uh, uh, I'll turn to the uh, confession itself, chapter 2, on God. Chapter 1, of course, deals with <coughs> the scripture. Chapter 2, in its first two sections, uh, expands on what the catechism that I just read say said. Let me read uh, section 1 of the confession of God and the Holy Trinity. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, giving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. And then the second section of the uh, confession goes in and uh, continues the definition in an extended form. And nowhere does the confession suggest uh, that understanding God is beyond the reach of human intellect. Now that doesn't mean that we find out God on our own power. That is impossible. That is impossible. 
God must reveal Himself to us. But once He reveals Himself, we understand. That is the idea of revelation. If revelation is given and it is not understood, it isn't revelation. It's obscurantism. Or it's riddling. Or it's uh, presenting something that is completely opaque. But it doesn't constitute revelation. The concept of revelation itself implies that not only does God uh, give us information, but that information is meant to be understood and can be understood. Otherwise, there is no revelation. <clears throat> well, let's look at um, the doctrine of God from Scripture. You turn, if you would, to... Um, we'll start at John, John chapter 1. We use the, uh, the statement, the scripture uses the statement, we say the uh, statement all the time, God is living. What do we mean by that, God is living? Any ideas? What does that mean, God is living? Yes, sir? He has consciousness, very good. He's active? Does it mean he has a pulse? Does it mean he has... A brainwave? No, obviously not. It means God is thinking. That's what the word living, the metaphor living means. God thinks. God thinks. God is a thinking God. Look at this uh, first chapter of, of John here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now here's the description that John uh, gives. Uh, of the word of God. This is the way he begins his gospel. Uh, the gospel of John is a very profound but a very simple book. But people when they read it sometimes skip over this introduction because it, while it's very profound, doesn't seem very simple. But in skipping over it, they're skipping over what John thought most important. This is how he begins the gospel. This is how he begins his explanation of Jesus Christ. And he ties it by his language, as we saw last evening, back to the Word of God who appears throughout the Old Testament and speaks to and through the prophets. The Word of the Lord appears saying. And the prophets understand who it is that they're speaking with. Well, here you have uh, in John the idea that the Logos is God. The Logos is God. Now, what does that Greek word mean? The King James and the New King James translate it uh, word, which is a perfectly fine translation. Um, let me read some of the meanings for that term given in the uh, Little and Scott lexicon. Uh, they list many meanings for the word logos. Uh, some of them are computation, reckoning, account, measure, esteem, proportion, ratio, explanation, pretext, plea, argument, discourse, rule, principle, law, hypothesis, reason, formula, definition, debate, narrative, description, speech, oracle, phrase, wisdom, sentence, and the last definition they list is word. And that's the uh, translation chosen by the King James and the New King James translators. Now what's common among all those? What's common among all these possible definitions? Well, what's common is simply the idea of thinking. That's the common thread here. Computation in the sense of calculation, reckoning, judging, so in the South we say, I reckon such and such. 
which means I think or I judge. I reckon this to be so. Uh, it's an old English way of speaking. Account, uh, as in uh, bookkeepers' accounts. Measure, esteem, that is to regard. All of these are intellectual acts. Every one of them. That's what's common to them all. We get, of course, from the Greek word logos, the English word logic. Uh, that's the cognate in English. Uh, it's also the root etymologically of uh, all of our words, such as theology, the study of God, the logic of God, or biology, that L-O-G at the end, uh, etymologically comes from logos. That is the study or uh, the science or the logic of life. Uh, intellectual through and through. And this is what John is saying here. Now the word logos was used in Greek philosophy for centuries before John wrote. But John is not adopting some meaning given to it by the philosopher Heraclitus. What he's doing is he's using a perfectly good Greek word and explaining it in Christian terms. Perfectly good Greek work and he, word and he's explaining it in Christian terms. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the wisdom. Tie it in with the wisdom back in Proverbs. Now, Proverbs has a great deal to say about wisdom. Uh, that may be more intelligible to you than the word word. In the beginning was the wisdom. Uh, in the beginning was the reason. Perfectly good translation for logos. In the beginning was the reason. Uh, and the reason, the word, was with God. And the reason was God. The word was God. Uh, sometimes... Uh, when uh, people hear this, they say, well, you're making reason God. Well, we're, I'm not making reason God. John's Gospel says that. The Logos was God. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Intellectual through and through. In stark contrast, as I uh, told you last night, uh, with the theory of evolution, which puts, uh, what shall we call it, non-living dead matter first, and then some living beings, and finally in the last few hundred thousand years, something that might be called man, something that has a characteristic of logic or reason, homo sapiens. That makes uh, the evolutionary view, makes uh, logic or reason a latecomer on planet Earth and a latecomer in the universe. The Bible doesn't. The Bible says that this Logos, notice the verses we just read, look at verse 4. In the Logos was life. And life was the light of men. And the Logos was life, and life was the light of men. Rather than life being deeper than logic, the Logos is prior. The Logos is prior. Completely opposite the Darwinian or evolutionary uh, worldview. <laughs> then we'll come back to John. Turn back to the Old Testament, if you would, please. To the book of Proverbs. And if you want to see a book in the Bible that is loaded with uh, information about knowledge and understanding and wisdom, read the book of Proverbs. Um, Proverbs chapter 3. I'm sorry, I must have the wrong citation here. You know what? It's Proverbs 3.19. I'm sorry, I did have it right. 
word by wisdom founded the earth. He's teaching the same thing that uh, John is teaching. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. And by his knowledge, the depths were broken up. Turn to uh, Jeremiah, if you would. Jeremiah 51. Verse 15, Jeremiah 51, 15. By his power, he has established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heaven by his understanding. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain. He brings wind out of his treasuries. If you think back to Genesis 1, how does God create? He speaks. He speaks. God says, let there be life. God says, let the earth bring forth such and such. You know, look through that chapter. Uh, it's repeated six or eight times in one chapter. God speaks. The Word creates the universe. The Word is prior to and superior to the creation. Life isn't deeper than logic. If we're talking about the divine life, it's the same as logic. If we're talking about human life, Human life isn't as deep as logic, far from what the Romantics and the Darwinians uh, would have us believe. Let me read, I mentioned to you, uh, Goethe's translation of Faust, uh, of, I'm not of Faust, but of uh, John 1 uh, yesterday. Let me read what actually Goethe wrote. He says, "'Tis writ, in the beginning was the word, I pause perplexed, who now will help afford? I cannot the mere word so highly prize. He's, he's rebelling against this. I cannot the mere word so highly prize. I must translate it otherwise. If by the Spirit, guided as I read, in the beginning was the sense. Take heed, the import of this primal sentence way, lest thy too hasty pen be led astray. Is force creative then of sense the dower? In the beginning was the power. Thus should it stand, yet while the line I trace, a something warns me once more to erase. The spirit aids. Now this isn't the Holy Spirit. This is the spirit that guided uh, Goethe. From anxious scruples freed, I write, in the beginning was the deed. See, he didn't want to accept the idea that logic is deeper than life. So he writes, in the beginning was the deed. The Romantics cannot believe God is the Word. And on the other hand, the Jehovah's Witnesses cannot believe that the Word is God. They deny the Word is God. Let's go on. The Logos is eternal, is the creator, is the light giver. Uh, God is truth. Back to uh, John 1, notice in verse 9, uh, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. This light lights every man. He's not speaking here of saving knowledge of Christ. Not every man is lit by the saving knowledge of Christ. What John is speaking of is the image of God, and we'll get into that more uh, in the next hour. But God is truth. The Father is truth. Then there are many verses that teach this. Look at Psalm 31.5. I commit my spirit, you have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. 
You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. But someone objects, isn't God love? Aren't we told in the scripture God is love? Yes, God is love. But he would not be love if it were not true priorly that God is truth. The only reason we can think that God is truth is because God is prior love. God is prior truth. Got that all mixed up. The only, way, the only reason we can think that God is love is because prior to that, God is truth. If we did not know that God is truth, we would have no reason for believing God is love. It is only the attribute of truth that makes the attribute of love possible. Uh, the Son is truth, John 14, 6. John 14, 6. If you'll turn back to uh, the Gospel of John again. And again, there are many other verses that might be cited. And this is the very famous one, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father uh, except through me. And when Jesus says these words, he's speaking literally. He's not using a metaphor. When he talks about the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John says he's the life in John 1. John says he's the truth in John 1. The only possible metaphor there is the way in the sense of a path. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father uh, except through me. Uh, the Holy Spirit is truth. And one chapter over in John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Back in John 1, uh, verse 14, Jesus is described as full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In Psalm uh, 43, 3, O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Psalm 36, verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. This is the very same thing that John, 1, John wrote about in chapter 1. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. This metaphor of light is used uh, throughout Scripture as uh, a symbol for truth. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. Uh, Peter talks about the light that shines in the darkness. It's a metaphor for truth. John referred to in chapter 1 to the true light in chapter 1 uh, verse 9. The doctrine of, the go of God includes the idea of omniscience. That is, that God knows everything. And omniscience is simply sovereignty, the idea of the sovereignty of God applied to knowledge and thought. Omniscience is simply the idea that the sovereignty of God is applied to knowledge and thought. Knows all there is to be known. Logic itself is the architecture of God's mind. Logic itself is the architecture of God's mind, to use another metaphor. It is the way God thinks. Logic is the way God thinks. Logic is not created. In the beginning was the Lagos. In the beginning. The universe is created. Man is created. But logic is not created. And this again is uh, a view that is contrary to what uh, some Reformed theologians teach. Um, here's a quote I'll give you from another theologian. Non-Christians maintain that man reasons univocally that is, with one meaning per word. Christians, on the other hand, maintain that all human reason is analogical. 
For the non-Christian, the law of contradiction, and we'll talk more about that later, that's the fundamental law of logic, the law of contradiction, is a principle of logic that stands above God and man alike. God and man are under the same system of logic, which is higher than both and exists independent of both. For the Christian, on the other hand, God exists before time and the laws of logic. The law of contradiction is part of the created temporal world. It is the expression of the internal coherence of God's nature, but is, but is not above God. The law of contradiction operates only under God and not above him. The Christian does not use it to say what can or cannot be true about God himself. And again, that's a very common view among some Reformed theologians. Uh, let me repeat one of the statements in here again. God and man are under the same system of logic for the non-Christian, which is higher than both and exists independent of both. For the Christian, on the other hand, the author says, God exists before time and the laws of logic. Well, certainly God exists before time. Time is created. But does God exist before the laws of logic? That would make God illogical. The author goes on, though, and inconsistently says that uh, the law of contradiction is the expression of the internal coherence of God's nature. But how do you judge the internal coherence of God's nature if the laws of logic don't apply to God? What he's done, and it's very common error, what he's done is he's set up a false dichotomy. He says either you have to accept the idea that logic is created, or you have to accept the idea that logic is superior to God, and God is subject to logic. And neither view is the scriptural view. The scriptural view is that logic is not created and logic is not superior to God because John says logic is God. It's not some standard external to God that he has to obey. It is simply the way God thinks. Logic is God's thinking. So if we think that uh, <clears throat> David was king of Israel and Absalom was the son of David, and we conclude that therefore Absalom is the son of a king of Israel, God reaches the same conclusion. God doesn't have some different logic by which if he thinks that David was king of Israel and Absalom is the son of David, therefore Absalom is the uh, nephew of the prime minister of Babylon. That would be a different logic. That would show you're not subject to the laws of logic. And God's arithmetic is the same as our arithmetic. Uh, you can go to our website and read an essay on math and the Bible where the author brings out very clearly a few of the instances of calculations being done in Scripture and derives from those calculations the principles of arithmetic. And this is revealed information. Mathematicians who are not Christians debate over the philosophical status of arithmetic. But scripture reveals arithmetic that says 2 plus 2 is 4. And it's 4 for God and it's 4 for man. It's not affected, arithmetic itself, logic itself is not affected by sin. What sin does is cause us to make mistakes in our thinking. It causes us to make mistakes in our adding of sums and our dividing and our subtracting. That's one of the effects of sin on the mind. But sin itself doesn't affect the logic or the arithmetic. Two plus two is four. It's revealed in scripture. So this sort of thinking that gives us a false dichotomy that says either logic is superior to God and therefore you're putting something superior to God or logic is created uh, is very misleading. Logic is simply the way God thinks. That's his uh, manner of thinking. John says, and uh, we need to read it again in John 1 there, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And the Logos makes everything that was made, 
means the universe itself. There's nothing absurd in the universe. There's nothing uh, ultimately illogical or irrational in the universe. The universe itself is made by the Logos. And it was this belief, uh, historically, that led to the development of science in the West. That the universe was understandable because it's made by a rational creator. In him was life, John says, and the life was the light of men. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now this is the source of thinking. Are there any comments or questions at this point? Any comments or questions? Yes, sir. That, that's certainly a major part of it because he emphasizes uh, throughout, or John emphasizes throughout his gospel, uh, Christ claims that no one knows the Father but the Son, and uh, no one knows except he to whom the Son reveals him. So Christ is the um, sole revealer of God the Father uh, to mankind. And uh, that's certainly a major part of it. Now, I'm sure there's more to it, but offhand I can't think of anything, Jim. It makes it very clear to us, though, that because of the doctrine of the Incarnation, that is, that Christ is both God and man, the God-man, uh, that there aren't two competing systems of logic uh, in his mind, that he divinely or humanly he doesn't think 2 plus 2 is 4 or when he counts his disciples he doesn't uh, add them up and say well 11 plus 1 is 12 in his human mind and in his divine mind to come up with a different idea uh, there's only one logic and uh, thinking about the incarnation in that sense is very helpful uh, because if there were some um, what shall we say, inadequacy in human language, then how could Christ, the incarnate Christ, reveal God to us? That shows in itself that human language is adequate for the revelation because Christ speaks Aramaic words and he reads the scriptures in Hebrew, human languages. And the fact that you have the second person of the Trinity doing that indicates that there's no inadequacy involved here. That the language is perfectly adequate to the task. Now he says to the disciples at one point, and perhaps you've already thought of it, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot hear them now or bear them now. Well, that's simply a infirmity on the disciples' part. They needed to learn more before they could be uh, taught everything that Christ had to teach them. It's not a matter of the Christ being unable to do it, he's omnipotent. And it's not a matter of the language being inadequate to the task. It's simply that the disciples were dull. He calls them, he, he reprimands them on several occasions. Don't you understand yet? Don't you get it? I have many things to tell you, but I can't tell you now. Because they're dull. Yes, sir. He does send the Holy Spirit when he uh, ascends into heaven. That's true. But he, even after the, uh, even after the resurrection, he opens their hearts. He's walking on the road to Emmaus, and uh, he's talking to the disciples. And the scriptures say he opens their hearts to understand the scriptures. He he opens their minds directly at that point. It is given in a uh, general fashion. After the ascension, the presence of Christ is not localized, as it were. And the Holy Spirit is everywhere given to believers. <laughs>
Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Would you be looking anywhere else for revelation? That is, uh, is God speaking to us apart from His word in any way today? The scriptures are the final word. Uh, the confession, let me read uh, the language of the confession here if I could. In chapter 1, uh, section 6 I believe it is, uh, the language of the confession which echoes scripture on the point is the whole counsel of God. And notice the words, the universals in this, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life. And that just about covers it. Is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence. There's your logic recognized by the confession, good and necessary consequence. May be deduced. They restrict the uh, hermeneutical principle to deduction. Logical deduction. May be deduced from Scripture unto which nothing at any time is to be added whether by new revelations of the spirit or traditions of men. The, the two major groups opposing the reformers were, of course, the Roman Catholics and the enthusiasts, the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists and the enthusiasts claimed they were getting new revelations from the spirit. And so that's the reason for that language in there. Uh, and the traditions of men, of course, are Roman Catholic uh, tradition. Um, but they, they rule out any further revelation um, between the time of the writing of the last book of the New Testament and the second coming of Christ. I once I had a fellow ask me just recently, well, are they trying to gag the Holy Spirit here because it says no new revelations of the Spirit? And no, they're not. In the scripture itself indicates 